Good evening. My name is John Sonnegard. I'm the Associate Provost for Global Learning and International Affairs at, here at Western Kentucky University. And this is the second installment in our Food Trotter series. And tonight is really special because we're gonna be talking about Moroccan food. So I'm gonna be joined by my colleague, Kirby, who is a student here at Western Kentucky. She's studying Arabic, she'll introduce herself. And, um, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about our experiences with Moroccan food. Kirby, you wanna say hi? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Kirby Gilstrap. I'm a junior at WKU and I study international affairs and Arabic, and I have a self-design major in sustainable development. Um, so I studied abroad in the summer of 2019 in Rabat, Morocco for two months. Uh, so that's why I'm here talking to you guys today. Great. Kirby, thank you. Well, why would Americans really care about Morocco, aside from the fact that it's like a really beautiful country? Well, just a couple things. Um, first of all, Morocco has the oldest living treaty with the United States. This was signed by John Adams and Thomas Jefferson in 1787. And basically it was a, a free trade and um, sort of anti-terrorism, anti-piracy treaty um, because there was a lot of issues with um, the Moroccan sultans um, attacking the ships of French and British traders as they went through the Straits of Gibraltar between Morocco and Spain. And the Americans said, hey, we're a poor country, you know, please don't raid our ships. And they agreed not to. So um, for over 250 years, the United States and Morocco have been very, very close. Um, now, the property that I mentioned, um, the oldest U.S. property abroad, is in, go ahead, um, the American legation in Tangiers. Tangiers is in the very far north of Morocco. In fact, from um, Tangiers, you can look across on a clear day the Straits of Gibraltar, 23 miles, and you can see Spain. Or you can say Britain, um, the rock of Gibraltar, which is actually not Spain. Um, but it's it's really fascinating. And the sea is such an important part of Moroccan food. And that's what's really important. We're going to be starting to talk about Moroccan food here in just a minute. Go ahead. So this is probably a little bit more of what most people expect Morocco to look like. Um, it's desert. A lot of Morocco is desert, but this is on the east side of the Atlas Mountains. The Atlas Mountains are a huge divider between the coast, the Atlantic coast, and then the Rift Mountains in the north, which divide um, the Sahara from um, the Mediterranean Sea. And so what that means is that Morocco has a very rich environment not only of extremely fertile land all along the coast, up and down the Atlantic side, and then over the Mediterranean side, um, but it also has some really unique qualities coming in from the desert. And um, go ahead. So here's the uh, a little map. Tangiers is up in top where that arrow is floating around. And those are the Straits of Gibraltar, one of the most strategic places on the planet because that connects the Atlantic Ocean with the Mediterranean. So all of Southern Europe and North Africa, the Middle East and so forth in through, um, you know, to your right there, um, heading east in the Mediterranean. And then of course the Atlantic along um, the side on the West. So Morocco has always been a very, very strategic um, location on the planet. And it's, the history is fascinating um, for a very long time, frankly, um, most of Spain was Morocco for longer than it's been Spain because um, Morocco had Andalusia, the, the southern part of Spain. And there was a fascinating period of time, which again feeds into our conversation about food called the Convivencia in Spain, which is when the Moors, the Muslims, the Jews, the Sephardic Jews, and Christians, Catholics, all lived together for about 300 years in harmony. Then things kind of fell apart when Isabel and Ferdinand came in and started killing the Jews and the Moors, but that's a different story. But during that period, 
that was so rich with these different cultures coming in together in Southern Spain and in Morocco um, to bring their food traditions, their cultural traditions, their religious traditions together. And at that point, that Morocco and Southern Spain um, was considered the center of knowledge in the Western world, not China, but in the Western world. Um, and was it was it must have been quite a remarkable time. So that's an important piece of, of thinking about Moroccan food, all these different cultures coming together, different religious traditions and cultural traditions coming together in a, an area that is abundant with seafood, with vegetables, with meats, um, to, so that you, and spices, so you can make some really, really amazing food. So um, let's, we're looking down a little bit on the map, you just kind of go down there, Marrakesh, you may have heard of that, Crosby, Stills, and Nash song about the train, um, but uh, Marrakesh is one of the most remarkable places and on, on the planet, but it is kind of a place where everything comes together. Up in the mountains, um, the first inhabitants of Morocco were are Berbers, and there are several different um, groupings of Berbers, each with their own distinct language. Then you have the, um, the nomadic people from the desert, there were Africans that would come up from um, Ghana, Burkina Faso, Mali, Algeria, um, into the, this big trading place called um, Marrakesh. And so they would bring their music, their culture, their food into you know this amazing city. Go ahead. There's a picture of Marrakesh. And this is a thing called the Jamal Fana which is one of my favorite places on the planet. It's truly an incredible place. It's this massive open space. In the daytime, it's a parking lot, but at about three o'clock in the afternoon, people, the cars are moved out and people start setting up these tents and booths and things like that. And that's where you find like the classic snake charmer and people sitting around telling stories and all of those little tents are little food booths and people will come in from all over all over Morocco, they come in from the mountains to sell their goods. People trade traders coming up, you know, across the Sahara to sell their things and then bring um, other things back to, you know, again wherever it was that they came from. Um, so it's really quite a remarkable, really really exciting place. And um, anyone who has an opportunity to visit there, I encourage them. But the best part is there's all this amazing food. So let's go on. So, oh my goodness, 35 years ago, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco. So I spent two years teaching at a university in a place called El Jadida. We called it, you know, Club Peace um, as opposed to Club Med because I had hot running water. Um, I lived about a block and a half from the Atlantic Ocean. There's this, go ahead. Idyllic Portuguese fortified town where they film movies and things like that um, is really quite incredible. We set up an English department at the university, taught it was fabulous. Uh, Moroccan students are incredible. Um, they learn languages like sponges, it's just amazing. Most Moroccans are fluent in four languages by the time they get to um, college. So um, moving right along. Kirby. Yes. Tell us a little bit about what you did there and what you ate. So luckily I got to go to Morocco um, during the last two weeks of Ramadan. That was my first two weeks that I was there. Um, so I was really just thrown into all of the traditional Moroccan cuisine and dishes. Um, so these are some photos that I took while I was there of a couple of spreads. One, The one on the left is from my host family um, in our living room when we had a lot of people over um, during Ramadan, uh, families, they, you know, when they break their fast, they often break it with uh, many people, either friends or, you know, their grandparents, cousins, aunts. I, I met everyone um, in my host family. Um, and then on the other, the other photo is uh, a photo from the, my host family's like aunt. Um, so my host mom's sister. Uh, so I got to travel to many different homes and eat their food and stuff. Um, in the middle uh, is the main dish. So on one, we have chicken and also I think they're um, dried apricots and um, 
dates and nuts. And then in the other is this beautiful platter of um, harira soup, which is what they use to break the fast every night in Morocco. Um, it's a very traditional soup uh, made with chickpeas, tomatoes, um, often made with meat, but it can also be made vegetarian or vegan. Yeah, that's awesome. So what is, um, quickly Kirby, what is Ramadan? So Ramadan is um, one of the holiest times in uh, the Muslim religion. Um, so in Islam, there's one month where um, Muslims fast from sunrise to sunset. Wait a um, minute, wait a minute. One month? One month, one whole month. And they fast? Fasting, no eating, like no drinking. They don't eat? All day, from sunrise to sunset. food. <laughs> I know. So this is about food. Um, but really during that time, they I had a lot of conversations with my my host sister about, you know, like, why do Muslims fast? And she told me that it was, um, you know, to have this more spiritual connection and to understand about people who aren't as privileged as you are, who go hungry um, in order to feel the same way that they feel. Um, and through those conversations and, and learning about it and you know, something else about Morocco, there's a lot of diversity in Morocco, but everyone fasts, whether you're even Christian or Jewish or not really religious at all, or if you're a super devout Muslim or a not devout Muslim, everyone fasts. Um, and so I decided, okay, I'll try it. And so um, about a week into my stay in Morocco, I woke up one morning and I said, I'm gonna fast. Um, so, and obviously I started it the next day, uh, cause I had to wake up at, you know, three, 4 AM and eat my final snack and drink my water, um, before I had to endure the whole day. Um, and I, you know, went to classes and just had to be like everyone else and not eat for the whole day. Um, and it, it was hard about 4 PM. I was like, Oh, I'm really hungry. I'm really thirsty. It's really hot outside. Um, but I was like, I'm almost there. So I went home and to my surprise, we were actually having a lot of guests over. So my, uh, like the grandparents of my host family were there, the cousins of my host family were there. And I, I went to my host sister and I told her, oh, hey, and Sam, today I, I fasted. And she was just like, no way, you did not. And proceeded to take me to each member of the family and tell them Kirby fasted today. And, um, the, the grandmother, she like hugged me and gave me a kiss on both my cheeks and was just, you know, talking to me in Arabic and how um, proud she was and happy she was that I um, fasted and decided to to take part in um, their culture and have that experience. Um, and when we broke the fast that night at the call to prayer, um, traditionally it's broken with a date so that you can get a lot of sugar in your body really quickly. Um, and I don't really like dates. Well, I didn't before this experience, um, but I ate the date. It was the best date I've ever had. And I, I just, tears formed in my eyes. It was so sweet and it was such a spiritual moment. I felt so connected with everyone around me. They were all super happy that I had decided to, to fast during Ramadan. Yeah, that's amazing. It, it's, um, and it's not easy. No. Because you can't drink anything and you get thirsty. What month were you there? I was, that was at the beginning of May. So May, May, yeah. And you know, days get really long in the summer mm -hmm. and it's, it's sunrise to sunset. And at sunset when um, the Imam can see a white hair cannot distinguish a white hair from a black hair when holding it up to um, to the horizon, which can get complicated if it's foggy or something like that. But then they issue the call to prayer and like an entire country that was not eating or drinking anything or smoking, wham, they hit it. I remember um, I had a, a very good friend who smoked a lot and um, that a table like that with the Herrera bowl. And then that in the middle, there's that, um, that big bowl that's covered that has the Herrera soup in it. 
Um, so where that's where the spoons are sitting next to the Herrera bowl, he would have a cigarette and a lighter. <laughs> and the first thing that he would do is have his cigarette and he'd be jittering and, you know, um, but it was uh, that it just, you know, my first thing was like, I drink a whole bottle of water, <laughs> but, but he, he had to have that cigarette. Then of course we all go into, then after that, now did your family do this? After everybody ate, you kind of sit around, notice those couches, they're like big, big cushions. And so people kind of lay down on them and maybe they fall asleep because they're exhausted and they've eaten a whole bunch of food. Um, but then afterwards, you get out and walk around town. Did mm -hmm. you do that? Um, my my host family did. I, I never did because I, I often just went to sleep because I had classes at 8 a.m. in the morning. Wow. Um, but yeah, <laughs> intensive Arabic, 8 a.m. every morning um, until about noon or two in the afternoon, depending on the day. Um, but my, you know, the the women would often stay and talk and socialize. And um, the men, they all left to do like a, the final nightly prayer. Um, and mm -hmm. I lived in this part of Rabat called Georgiana, which is like the most beautiful mosque in the area. Um, everyone goes there during Ramadan to hear the nightly prayers. And there was actually one night I was with my, my host program. We um, were celebrating breaking the fast together um, at a restaurant in town and they were trying to, to take me home and they couldn't take me home because the streets were blocked off. Um, right. So we had to just take everyone else home first. And then eventually by like 11 PM when the streets were finally open, they could, they could drop me off. Um, but so the men would always go to the prayers um, that evening and the women would all, we would all sit and socialize until Kirby went to bed. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Ramadan is fascinating. And, um, and it's, it's such a, you know, it's such a, such an, well, it's one of the five pillars of Islam. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and so, you know, when we have our Muslim students on campus during the month of Ramadan and the Islamic month is, or year is on a, is on a lunar year. So the months move, right? According to, you know, so sometimes it'll be in the spring, other times it'll be in the summer. And so, you know, oftentimes our students are fasting, you know, while they're, while they're here in Bowling Green. Um, and so we need to just be a little sensitive that um, they might be very, very hungry mm -hmm. um, and to not eat in front of them really, that's about it. So yeah, let's go on. Oh my. <laughs> So what? this, who is that? That's me. Um, you going to bed? No. Oh. Um, that was, I, this is not me when I was wearing this to um, the Ramadan celebration to Eid. Um, but I, uh, this is when I was trying it on. My host mom, she, you know, didn't want me to go to Eid with, with the family without having some traditional um Muslim attire. And so she let me borrow this for the day. Um, and I just, I felt so beautiful in it. She also did my hair um, in a traditional way as well and gave me a purse to have and some jewelry so you can see it um, in the photo. Um, but then the photo of the food is from um, Eid the next morning, the last day of Ramadan, um, where you get with the whole family and eat all day. <laughs> Um, and so this was actually breakfast, despite there being many sweet treats on the table. Um, so, for example, the pancake looking item, I called them Moroccan pancakes. Those are called Fagrir. Um, absolutely delicious. They have like little holes on them. Um, you can't see them. I think they're on the other side. But you put some honey on there. There's some Nutella that you could put on there. Um, and we just ate all these beautiful treats throughout the whole day. Um, and I met a lot of family members as well. Even more family members came to this final celebration of Ramadan, uh, family from Tangier um, who spoke really great English as well. So they were helping me and teaching me about Ramadan traditions and cultures and things. Cool. Yeah, you know, I think, um, well, so my, my swanky friends um, from Casablanca, the big city, 
Casablanca, I don't know, about seven million. It's a big city. Um, who would sort of show off by, you know, they would always speak in French. And so though they called those the the pancakes, mille trous, a thousand holes. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, but oh my gosh, those the sweets are so wonderful, the halwa. Um, so let's go. Let's keep going. Oh, these guys. So this is, you know, very much a, a traditional um, sort of countryside um, way of eating. And just a couple things that, that you know, we'll see here. Um, first of all, uh, there's all men. And so it is not uncommon at all, um, uh, especially in the countryside, for um, men and women to eat separately. And, um, and that's the case here. And notice, you know, no, everybody's got their fork out. Um, this is their fork. And, um, and see the, the guys, the little kid up on top and the guy with the, the yellow hat, um, they make little balls of couscous. They put their hand in, into the, the tagine and they grab some couscous and they make it into a little ball and pop it in their mouth. Now, Oftentimes when you stay with a Moroccan family, the mother, the sort of maternal one, um, uh, usually she'll have cooked the meal um, um, or maybe she has a servant. If they have a little bit of money, she'll have a servant who cooked the meal. But the mother will reach in, grab a, um, a, a bunch of couscous in her hand and make a little ball. And then she'll go um, reach over to the prize guest and pop it into the guest's mouth. Eat, eat, cool, cool, um, which is kind of fun. Um, but it takes a little getting used to having someone feed you with their hands. Um, and so anyway, this is interesting. Now, another thing I want to mention too, is the difference between rural and urban Morocco. And in the Moroccan language, they make a distinction. The Romani, Roman city people, and um, the Buldi, from the country. So they also will call chickens that or animals that. So Romanis um, are animals that have been raised um, in sort of an industrial process, right? And so those a Romani chicken, maybe you'll find it, a butcher will have it, or um, you'll definitely, if you go to if you go to a grocery store, you'll, you'll get one there. Um, and a buldy chicken is considered to be tastes a little bit better. It's what we would call a free range chicken. Um, and, and so oftentimes, you know, um, you'll see people, they're haggling about everything when they buy stuff, right? The price, the quality of the product, you know, to, so they can get the price down and everything else. But, you know, the first question is, is that a city chicken or is it a country chicken? You know, and um, um, so that's always kind of fun. So let's go. I never heard that about the chickens. Oh, and it's, it's, yeah, and it's a big deal. There's a butcher. Okay, go ahead. So um, this video, it's, it's the only video I have from my time there where I was uh, actually attempting to eat with my, with my hands. Um, that definitely took some getting used to. And my host family was, was really great. Um, in teaching me how to do it with with my um, hands and, um, you know, showing me that you do it with bread, with soups. Um, there were a few times where I would I would try and it just it was not going well. So they're like, do you need a fork? And so they would go and grab me some silverware and everyone else would be eating with their hands and I'd be using actual silverware. Um, but that was that was definitely a cultural norm that I had to get used to while I was there. Um, and another cultural norm that I really loved was um, what you say at the beginning of any undertaking, which is Bismillah. Um, and so that's kind of like an Islamic term. It, com it comes from Islam, but it's more cultural than anything. You know, you say it before eating food, um, after a meal, you say it um, even when getting in a taxi. Uh, so you say it before you go so that you can get to the place safely. Um, were there any cultural norms, John, that, that you wanted to talk about? Well, yeah, just a couple, like the bismillah and the use of, 
of like religious words in the language. It's so it's it's ubiquitous. It's it's everywhere, and um, the the other thing along with the language is like keeping clean, and washing is a really 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 important part of different practice in Islam. You, you know, you wash and you wash your hands and your feet before you go into the mosque to pray so that you're, you know, as close to clean as you can be before you, you pray to God. And then the same thing um, before a meal, like when we would eat at um, a family's house. So like I said, there, there's this whole hierarchy and this gender division, right? And mom's the one who cooks all the food. Well, and you know, the, the girl, female children will help out. Um, and oftentimes it's the youngest, like mobile child, right? Not a baby, but the youngest child who will go around the table before everyone's eating with a big pitcher of water. And then maybe someone else will have a little bowl or they'll set the bowl on the table and they, they pour water on your hands and you clean your hands so that when everybody's digging into that that common um, tajin to eat their their couscous and their food that they know that that um, it's clean, and you only use your right hand to dig into the um, you know to to eat with everything that goes in your body is on the right hand and everything that kind of works its way out is on the left, um, so you don't want to be using that hand. Um, but there are just so many wonderful little and bread and couscous like so bread which is an essential, you know, it's the fork, right? It's an essential piece, but you know, sometimes people accidentally knock it off the table or something like that and it falls on the floor. And you know, Morocco is not a wealthy country and there are many, many, many poor people, although you won't see anyone starving in Morocco. Um, um, but you know, so food is very, very precious and revered. When they drop, if, they, if, if a piece of bread touches the floor, They'll pick it up, dust it off, kiss it, and say bismillah, you know, and then, then they can use it again to eat. But that little practice, it's sort of like the, the, the three-second rule, um, you know, but of picking it up and giving it a kiss and, and you know, telling it that it's, it's, it's okay is, is really sweet. The other thing you mentioned that when you were doing Ramadan, they gave you a kiss on the left shoulder and the right shoulder. Mm-hmm. Well, a story that I was told about that was that you have a, um, there's an angel on your right and an angel on your left and, and a devil on your left. And you never know who's who. So you got to kiss the right and you got to kiss the left. You kiss the angel to tell how much you appreciate, you know, um, the blessing. And you kiss the, the, the little devil um, so that they feel wanted and that they do, don't do bad things to you. But I always really appreciated that about the two cheek kissing thing. So let's go on. What's that? So these are some photos that I took um, in the Medina. Um, so the Medina is like the old part of the city. So in it's called like Medina Kadima, which literally means like old city in Arabic. Um, also, souk is a word that's often used in souk translates roughly to like a shop, um, but they are pretty different. What our, what we think of a shop, a place to get groceries, you know, you think of Kroger, of Walmart, of some big grocery store, whereas um, the souk is more similar to kind of like a farmer's market, um, but more crowded. <laughs> um, and that's where my host family would go shopping for pretty much everything that they needed. Um, we were a 10 minute walk from the Medina in Rabat and you could find any spices, rice, flour, sugar, fruits, vegetables, anything like that at the Medina. Um, and they would shop there every week. And then occasionally when they needed more things like shampoo or um, deodorant items like that, then they would go to the bigger grocery stores. Yeah, the grocery stores, there were not many of them. Like the town that I lived in, which at that time was about 100,000 people, did not have a grocery store. Wow. It just had these little markets in what they call Hanut, which is like a shop that's owned by some person. And everything that you could find in a Kroger would be smashed into that shop except the frozen food section because no one would eat frozen food. It's not fresh. 
um, and they're they're obsessed with fresh. And so, like you know, I remember um, going into um, the grocery store in Rabat, and they had you know hadn't seen you know like meat in a plastic container on a little styrofoam tray. Like you know, how else do you buy meat, right? And I, wow, that's got to be good. And I remember my Moroccan friend said, "Don't buy that. Don't buy that. You can't trust it. You don't know how old it is." Because a lot of times in the butcher, back to that chicken, you can, a lot of butchers will have chickens in the back of their shop. I want that one. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, you, they, they come out with a chicken that was freshly killed and plucked. And that's the only way that they're going to trust it. Well, of course, because most people don't have access to refrigeration or they haven't. And, you know, if the meat isn't super fresh, it'll go bad. Um, and so that, I, that always really struck me. And now, you know, oftentimes I, I, I think twice, you know, when I'm buying um, chicken in the grocery store and we don't even think about, you know, how fresh it is. You know, we just assume it's fresh, you know, and certainly something that's freshly killed. Um, but one other one other thing um, that was related to that. So, you know, these outdoor shops and like these are different spices. There's cumin, turmeric, um, coriander, gr dried ground garlic peppers, paprika, all ginger, you know, all kinds of wonderful stuff. And it all goes into the, into the couscous. Um, but um, there was a butcher near my house. There are actually the, about a block's worth of butchers. So each one had his own little shop, but you know, you'd go and look at the meat and then just be hanging out there on a hook, you know? And, um, and I remember one, you know, let you hang meat hanging outside on a hook. What happens? Flies go to get on it. You know, which made us like, ooh, flies. You know, and there was one butcher that didn't have flies on his meat. And we're like, oh, what are we gonna buy from that guy? And I as we were buying the meat, his son came out with a can of bug spray and was spraying the meat. So we decided not to buy that meat. Oh my god. After that, we always bought meat with flies on it because we knew it would be fresh. <laughs> um, and of course it's getting cooked anywhere. Um, so let's let's go on. So these are some photos of some traditional meals that I had when I was in Morocco. I think these were in Meknes. Um, and so one is of couscous, that's with the, the carrots and the um, celery, the chickpeas on top. So you can't really see the couscous there. Um, but that was one of the first times that I had couscous, uh, delicious. And then on the other is uh, what's called a Berber omelet. Um, so it's like this tomato sauce with um, poached eggs and fresh herbs, probably some other things in there too. Um, that was probably one of the best dishes I had the entire time when I was in Morocco. So I have to say, and my Moroccan friends always thought I was kind of crazy, but that um, the, the Berber omelet or what we used to call tagine kefta. So this thing here, you know, you've seen a couple of them, but this is my tagine. Um, and this is a city tagine. This is not a country tagine, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, but my favorite tagine, ah, perfect. My favorite tagine is a tagine kefta, which is ground meatballs, little meatballs, tiny meatballs, and then in that tomato sauce. So they, they take that tomato sauce with spices in it, and they put the little meatballs in there uncooked, and then they'll break a couple of eggs in there, and they poach the meatballs and the eggs all in that pot. So these little pots and the ones up on top there, the shiny bit is like the glazed bit, right? The shiny bit. And the tops are not glazed. Um, you know, like, like the bottom here, not glazed. That allows the vapor to escape. And this is a brilliant cooking device. Absolutely brilliant. So it sort of, it functions kind of like a, a pressure cooker, but not with pressure, but it, it, steams and vaporizes the food so it comes out really really nice especially with the spices and everything but my little city one it's glazed on top so the the um vapors can't get out so what it drips inside of there which is a little bit um less subtle in terms of you know cooking but that's just kind of one of these little details of centuries old cooking pot and with the tagine um Anything that you cook in a tagine is a tagine. So mm -hmm. um, in this video here, it's just showing uh, a, t a worker um, outside of Rabat in Salah. Um, and he 
actually makes these tagines all day. I was able to tour their facilities and I actually got to make my own tagine, which was really cool. Um, I got to sit there with him and try to make the clay pot. Um, but anything that you cook in this pot is, is called a tagine. So you can have uh, like chicken tagine, beef tagines, the Berber omelet is, is in a tagine pot. Um, so anything becomes a tagine, you know, if it's cooked in that pot because it gets this like special earthy flavor. Um, and whenever I was bringing my tagine home, uh, I think this just really speaks to the kindness of Moroccans. Um, but so it was often assumed that I could speak French because most white people in Morocco speak French. They don't speak Arabic, but I was there to study Arabic. Um, and so I, I'm walking home with my tagine and my backpack on and, you know, lugging all this stuff around. And, and this woman just comes up to me and tries to start speaking to me in French. And I, I tell her, oh, I speak Arabic or English. And so she's trying to explain to me how to season my tagine so that I don't ruin it. Um, because mm -hmm. if you don't season your tagine first, then, you know, if you try to put it in the oven, then it will crack and then you'll just have clay pot all over your oven or stove top or anything like that. Um, and it just, it was such a kind moment where she was just, you know, trying in her best way to explain, um, cause she was trying to explain it to me in English, how to, um, oil the pot so that I don't break it and how to take care of it. And she was just a random stranger on, on the streets of Morocco. I love it. You know, my experience was that people were so helpful, sometimes a little too helpful in your business, but so helpful. And, you know, just a little thing on that language, which, you know, two pieces that I thought were kind of funny. Um, I, so I taught at a university and again, because, you know, I look like I do, everyone thought I spoke French, which actually I do. And, um, so I would, especially at the end when my Arab, my Moroccan Arabic was very good. Unfortunately, I've forgotten most of it. Um, but I would have these conversations with the Dean of, of, of the university and he would always speak to me in French and I would respond back to him in Arabic. And I kept asking him. Why should you either speak to me in English or speak to me in Arabic? Why should we use the language of the colonialists to communicate when neither of us are the colonialists? And he would always, and one time his wife started laughing because she, she spoke English and she, she started laughing um, because she said, you really don't understand that he's speaking to you in Arabic, do you? You know, it was really funny. Another experience that I had, and this made me feel really, really good. We were climbing up Mount, Mount Tubkal. Mount Tubkal is about 16,000 feet. And um, uh, um, we went to this little, there's a little tiny village on the, on the side of the mountain to eat. And we were, you know, talking with a guy, oh, you're Americans, all Americans speak Arabic and they speak Arabic so well. And I just thought, I thought, yeah, that's, you know, 25 years of Peace Corps in Morocco. That, that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, so anyway, enough on the Arabic. Um, so what do we got here? What do we have here? So um, this is of some Moroccan mint tea. If you ever go to Morocco or if you know any Moroccans or if you just love tea and want to make this, I definitely think you should. Um, so the video is of me trying to pour the tea really high because that's a sign of like you're, you're welcome here, you're loved. Um, if you like the higher you pour the tea, the more welcome your guests are. Um, that takes a lot of talent. So that was me trying to, to focus really hard and pour the tea and not get it out of the glass. Um, and then the photo on the other photo is just me on the beach with a glass of tea, which is the coolest thing ever. It's so delicious too, isn't it? Mm-hmm, so good. There's mint. I tossed that one in there, you know, the mint tea. And and it must appeal to Southerners. You know, I'm, I'm not a Southerner, but it must, um, Moroccan mint tea must appeal to Southerners because it is very sweet. Okay. So the last slide here that we have to talk about um, is actually my experience with taking a cooking class while I was in Chef Shawin. Um, unfortunately, I had sprained my ankle uh, oh. weeks prior, um, and so while well, everyone else in my program got to hike the beautiful mountains and waterfalls by Chef Shawin, um, I couldn't do that. So my program set up a cooking class for me, so I got to do this one-on-one -on -one cooking class 
um, where we went to the souk and bought all the ingredients and then went and cooked it from, from buying it at the store to having it on my plate for food. So I made like a vegetable tagine, I made Moroccan bread from scratch, I made the Moroccan salad, um, and these beautiful almond pastries called gazelle horns. Um, I had had them when I was in, in Morocco, and I was like, these are, these are delicious, absolutely the best cookie I've ever had. Um, so I, I told them that that's the one I wanted to make. Little did I know that those are actually the hardest cookies to learn how to make. Um, so that took about three hours just on, on the gazelle horns. You have to make these little finger rolls and then put the dough on them and then clip them so that they look nice and pretty like in the photo um, on the side. Um, but it was definitely worth it. And I learned how to make all these different recipes and I got to bring them home in my cute little recipe book and make them for my family. Um, so it was definitely one of the best experiences while I was there. Yum. So Kirby, when are you coming over? <laughs> I love those. They are so good. I haven't, I haven't made the gazelle horns since um, I was in Morocco because those take a lot of time. And also I need cert like certain ingredients that we don't really have here. They're not super common um, in order to make them. Um, also with the Moroccan bread that I learned how to make there, uh, they have live yeast. And my, my host mom also had live yeast. Um, and I'd never really done a lot of cooking before Morocco. Uh, so I came home, I tried to make Moroccan bread for my mom. It was like two weeks after I got back. And I was like, oh, mom, you have to try this bread. It's so good. It's the best bread I've ever had. And I follow my recipe. I, I use the yeast and the flour and everything. And um, But I, I also halved the recipe. And um, it turns out they had active yeast, whereas I used active dry yeast. Mm -hmm. I didn't activate it before I cooked it. So the bread didn't rise at all. Um, and I also doubled the salt because, you know, I have the recipe for everything but the salt. So I made some pretty bad Moroccan bread, um, but I have made it successfully since then. <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to make. And again, bread is such a, an important staple. And oftentimes in the little towns, you'll see kids going with like a piece of wood and four or five little dough balls of bread on it. And they're going to the local oven because they don't have one in their house. And then the, the baker puts it in there. They pay him just a tiny bit of money to bake their bread for them. And then the kid goes back with the, um, with the, um, the baked bread and it's, it's fresh mm -hmm. and it's still hot when it gets there. And, oh, yum. So Bryson Keltner has a question for you, Kirby. Shall I read it? Yes, please. Bryson says he will never forget traveling through the Atlas Mountains to Camel Trek in the Sahara. Kirby, what experience in Morocco sticks out as your favorite? Hi, Bryson. Um, that is a very hard question. I think um, probably just living with a host family um, and getting that connection. You know, both my, my host siblings were younger and I'm the baby of my entire family, the youngest of all of them, even like my cousins. Um, so I've never had that sibling connection before. I've never had like a, like a host sister, a younger sister. Um, and so we got to talk about, you know, boys and love and like racism in the US, you know, having really mature conversations with them. And my host brother was learning um, the same Arabic grammar structures that I was. Uh, so we got to study together as well. So just that that whole experience of living with a host family. That's cool. Thanks, Kirby. <gasps> Louis! <laughs> Usted Gerwan. Awesome. Kefta tagine is my favorite too. It, even though I'm a vegetarian now, it was it was pretty good when I had it in Morocco. <laughs> I love it. We're going to have to make that together sometime. All right. Katie Bush has a question. She says, did you find that there was a lot of variety in day-to-day -day meals when in Morocco? We eat so many different cuisines in the U.S. on a regular basis, so I'm always curious about this. 
Wow, that's a great question. One thing that we've largely forgotten in the United States is that there are seasons and with seasons come different foods. And so, you know, in Morocco, you have a lot of geographic differences and then you have these seasonal differences. So that brings a lot of diversity. Then you have, um, I mean, I remember a Berber woman and uh, uh, an Arab woman arguing over um, who invented bread. And um, the Berber woman said, well, you know, of course it was Berbers because Berbers run all the, all the, the patisserie, which is a French word. Um, the Berbers run all the patisserie and patisserie is um, where you go to buy your bread. So Berbers brought it, which I always thought was hysterical because, you know, they're talking about a, you know, a French bakery. Um, but anyway, um, so there's also a lot of other influences on the food. So not, you, know, you have these, these, these seasonal differences, you have these regional differences, but then of course there's also, um, you know, a lot of French influence, there's Spanish influence, there's Chinese, there's Indian, you know, there's all kinds of things. And then the other thing is a lot of Moroccans leave the country. They go to France, to Italy, to Germany, Canada, the United States, and then they send money home to their family. So when they come back, they're bringing these different culinary traditions back. And then of course they put their own little Moroccan spin on it. So you wind up with some really, really interesting foods. When I was in Morocco, um, I tried a lot of different new foods for the first time, um, including like chickpeas. I'd had hummus, the smashed chickpea version, but I'd never had whole chickpeas. Um, and also like couscous, I tried that for the first time um, and really ex expanded my palate. Um, and all of that made me realize you know, for years I wanted to be a vegetarian. Um, and it wasn't until I went to Morocco that I realized I can be a vegetarian. I can I can do this and try all of these um, different foods and incorporate them into my diet at home. Wonderful. So we have so, a question. Mm -hmm. And it says, um, did either of you ever try Bastilla? I did not. I have. What and is Bastilla, John? So Bastilla's, it's kind of flat. It's a really interesting thing. It's like, it's not bread. It's, it's almost puff pastry that is stuffed with oftentimes some, a combination of sweet and savory and, and then spices. And, you know, the best is pigeon. So they'll, they'll do pigeon in there. Um, but it's often, you know, done with chicken or, or other things and it's minced up and it's, it's divine. And you can, it almost tastes like a dessert, um, you know? So, and also um, Louis, I just wanna really tip my headphones to, to, to Louis um, because, and I, I think Kirby may have a thing to, or to say, um, I'm hoping that sometime we can do one of these together and Louis can show us how he cooks Moroccan food because he has a channel. He's one of our Arabic professors from Morocco, he's awesome. Yes, last semester we actually did a, a virtual cooking event for the Arabic club um, where Ustad Gerwan taught us how to make um, harira soup. It was great. So um, Wesley Ann Watkins asks, what is one spice you learned to use in Morocco that you continue to use while cooking here in the United States? Um, for me, it's not really a spice. Um, it's like, I, I learned that I liked a lot of different spices, but I haven't really, I guess, actually, actually cumin. Mm -hmm. I have started cooking so much more with cumin ever since I was there. Yeah, I remember going, when I first went, being kind of disappointed because I like really spicy hot food, hot spicy food. And they don't really do hot food in Morocco. And yeah. you know, it, it has a lot of spice in it, but it's not hot. But my favorite is this um, called Ras al Hanout. Hanout, as you know, we said before, is a little shop. 
and shopkeepers will make their own little blend of spices like those shops that the spice shops that we saw earlier they'll also have their own special blend right and um rasa hanut means the head of the of the shop and so it's their their special blend and um you know i get i, I source mine from a place called savory spice in denver um, which is pretty good, but it's not as good as, as Zaki, who was my local Hanut. Are there any other questions? Kirby, I have one more for you. Okay. Did you feel safe when you were in Morocco? Yes. There... There were times, there were times where I felt unsafe, but I think that it was more warranted out of my own fears and biases. Um, but, you know, I, I would tell people I feel safer in Morocco than, than I do sometimes in, in Bowling Green or in big cities in the U.S. Um, people were always helpful. I, I took a cab to school every day. Um, and I would just speak in Arabic with the taxi drivers. And, um, and even if, if you don't speak Arabic or um, French, you know, you can get around pretty well, even with English. A lot of people speak English there. Um, but I, I never really felt unsafe in Morocco the whole time I was there. And I think that everyone should, should visit Morocco. It's one of the most diverse countries in the world. You know, we were talking about the geography of it. And that's something that I like to talk about a lot. You can go to the desert, you can go to the ocean, you can go to the mountains, waterfalls. Um, it's incredible how much diversity there is in this one country. There are, we found monkeys in, the, in these like gorgeous trees that looked like it was in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains while I was there. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah, it really is. And I, I'm so grateful um, that I took a risk. And after I left, uh, left in the middle of my graduate program um, to go to Morocco and the Peace Corps and to teach um, from Nebraska, right? And uh, if I hadn't done that, I certainly wouldn't be here with you today, Kirby. Um, it has added so much to my life. And I'm really grateful for that. So, you know, I just, I'm, I'm so happy. One of the things that really excited me about coming to Western Kentucky was the Arabic language program and what a fine program it is. And, you know, I've met so many wonderful students like you, Kirby, you know, who have started taking Arabic while they're here and have taken um, the big risk and got on, an, uh, on a plane to explore someplace that is totally different and you know are willing to share that so i want to thank you kirby thank you for having me this has been really great to reminisce over morocco i can't like never stop talking about it <laughs> i can't you know i have to say i can't either and it was such a delight you know talking talking to you about it, it brought just so many memories came back um and you know i can't wait till we can get together and um talk about um, Morocco and have some Moroccan food together. And I can't wait to have some Moroccan food with, with Louis. You know, maybe we'll have you guys over or something. That'd be fun. Do you want to, should we tackle this last question? Yeah, that's fine. Let's do it. So I'm going to ask, so Susan um, Hoffmeister Dordoni asks, did you need to learn to comport yourself differently as a woman? especially in public, as opposed to in the US? Um, I came prepared to do that. I, you know, I, I don't think I brought any shorts with me. Um, I brought loose pants um, and shirts that would cover my shoulders. Um, but when I when I got there, I found that it was more about respecting the culture and the cultural differences versus having to like it wasn't because I wanted need, needed to cover myself for any reason it was because I was just respecting the cultural differences there and I would see Moroccan women walking around and, and again I was in Rabat um, which is 
a more modern city, but I would see them walking around in shorts and tank tops. Um, there was a, um, a store, a clothing store by my school um, with, you know, it looked just like Forever 21 clothes that we would see mm -hmm. here in the US. Um, and even the men in my program, you know, it was weird for men to wear shorts as well. You know, you should, they encouraged you wear jeans because that's just what's culturally normal. Um, and the more that you fit in, especially if you're going to be there for a long time, like I was there for two months and I didn't want to face any issues. Um, and so I just prepared myself beforehand of I'm going to be respectful to the culture that's there and, you know, dress how I think is appropriately. I even I had a dress that did come to my knees, but I, I thought, oh, I need to wear leggings under it. And so I did, but then I found that wasn't really necessary. Um, and I never had to cover my hair or anything like that. Um, and I think that, no, I, I didn't really have to act that differently than I do here in the US, but it was more, when I did, it was more about respect for the culture and not out of, of fear or anything like that. That's great. Well, we have one more question. I think this is a good one to, to finish on. So uh, Fatima asks, glad you got to, she said, glad you got to visit my country. And then she asked, what's your favorite city and why? So I'm, I'm gonna, it's hard to say one, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna give two. El Jadida, where I lived, has got to be my favorite city because it's home. Esuera though, which is um, further down the coast. So the ain't, the old name for my city was Mazagan. The old name for um, Esuera is Mogador. And it like like as, uh, El Jadida, it had a Portuguese fortified city and it's, it's beautiful, it's on the coast. There's an island off. And then there was a Casbah. And in 1962, when they had an earthquake, half the Casbah went into the, into the ocean. Jimi Hendrix tried to buy it. And he wrote a song called um, Castles in the Sand about, about Esuera, but it is such a just incredibly beautiful place. But El Jadida has to be my favorite place. How about you? Um, What's your favorite? For me, I have to go with Chef Shawin. Uh, it's known as the Blue City. Um, and, it, and it's not because of how beautiful the city is, though it is incredibly beautiful. But my my whole program, we went together and we kind of broke off into little groups and we were exploring the city. And just every time we would all find each other again. And I, I have never experienced anything like that before or since where, you know, four of us would go one way and four of us would go the other way. And then 10 minutes later, we'd all reconverge in the same spot when we're just like, oh, where's so-and-so? And then just we're all together again. Um, and you could get lost down these little alleyways and find your way back um, and always come back together. It was, it was magical. That's wonderful. Well, Kirby, thank you again. And it's such a delight to share, you know, our little travels together. And I'm so happy, you know, to have had the opportunity to meet you. And again, I'm so grateful for the Arabic program here and um, the opportunity that affords you know, Kirby and, and so many other students. So thank you very much for joining us for Food Trotters. We look forward to our next episode where we explore the world with our mouths. Thank Bye you. Bye everyone. Bye, Bye Kirby, thank you. Bye John. Ma salama. Ma salama.